relatively new industries like the motion picture business grew to become highly successful in the 60s, with over 200 films being produced annually. The territory's burgeoning economy also brought large-scale reclamation projects to create much-needed land, and an accelerated housing program which in later years would result in nearly half the population living in public estates. Hong Kong's fishing fleet was also at its greatest during the 60s, with close to 150,000 people actively employed in the fishing industry. This has since rapidly declined. Some things haven't changed. The weather being one. The annual typhoon season was the same then as it is today. Although modern Hong Kong is often considered an economic marvel and eyed with great envy by many of its contemporary city-states, the territory's infrastructure does suffer serious shortcomings. A completely saturated road network places severe restriction on any future planning. Also, most of the territory's prime land has already been taken up majority of the population living and working on small plateaus hemmed in by steep hillsides. It was problems like these that first prompted consultants in the late 60s to declare the absolute necessity for an underground railway if the city's transportation systems were not to become completely overloaded by the end of the 70s. In early 1972, after much deliberation, the government decided that, in principle, it was going to proceed with the project. A mass transit steering group was set up, which immediately authorised preparatory work to begin. If the concept of an underground ever had a champion in its formative years, it was the then financial secretary, Sir Philip Haddon Cave. He had always believed in the concept of a subway system and became a forceful figure in forging the basic shape that the undertaking was to follow. Within a year, a Japanese consortium had made a preemptive bid and a letter of intent drawn up and signed in early 1974. A financial man with a shipping background, Norman Thompson was appointed the corporation's first chairman. But within a year of his appointment, the deal with the Japanese began to falter. Then, in what was considered the worst setback for the project to date, the Japanese consortium decided that in view of an unstable world economy, they had no option but to withdraw. The Mass Transit Provisional Authority then quickly dispensed with the single contract approach and called for new tenders on a multi-contract basis. This was to prove a vital decision in getting the project moving again. New tenders poured in, and the venture was once more underway. As originally envisaged by consultants in the early 70s, the planned railway system was a 50-station, four-line undertaking with two harbour crossings. The consortia bid had actually been based on building only the first stage, or initial system as it was called. 
after the dissolution of the single contract approach, the system was further reduced for economic reasons to the modified initial system. In November 1975, at a small groundbreaking ceremony, the construction of the railway finally began. Within a year, major contracts worth close to six billion Hong Kong dollars were either under negotiation or had been awarded. Although the corporation supervised overall construction, each contractor was free to submit his own design, subject only to tender specification. Financing had been raised on the open market, most bearing Hong Kong government guarantees. The property sector also benefited. Deals were struck whereby housing for 50,000 people and more than 2 million square feet of commercial and office space was to be built on MTR land. The then governor of the territory, Sir Murray Maclehose, took an active interest in the project and on several occasions served as mediator between the corporation and those residents whose lives were being disrupted by construction. Sometimes this was taking place right on their doorsteps, with balconies having to be removed for the placement of heavy machinery. Technical problems facing the contractors were also formidable. Soil conditions couldn't have been worse for driving tunnels. Consisting mainly of decomposed granite and alluvial deposits, large boulders were frequently encountered, many of which had to be hand-split, slowing tunnel driving considerably. Compressed air tunneling was needed in many cases to hold back large quantities of water which would have otherwise flooded the drives and caused subsidence above. Station construction under Nathan Road required the placement of elaborate steel decking to keep traffic flowing with minimal disruption. The harbour crossing consisted of 14 reinforced concrete tubes, each 100 metres long. These were constructed in dry dock at Chai Wan, then floated out and sunk into dredged trenches on the harbour floor. With the modified initial system well underway and to capitalize on the mobilization of the construction industry, it was decided in June 1977 to extend the system along the western Kowloon Peninsula to one of the territory's fastest growing new towns, Chunhua. Within two years, track testing on the modified initial system had begun and thereafter a rapid succession of ceremonies each marking the completion of new sections of the line. Then in February 1980, the full modified initial system was officially opened by Her Royal Highness Princess Alexandra, seven weeks ahead of schedule. During Chinese New Year, a few days later, three quarters of a million people were carried by the system in one 24-hour period. The mass transit railway had arrived.